Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to share this platform with uh, David and Bjorn. 20 years ago in Rio, some of us were working on these very issues. We've got some things to be pleased about, but a great deal to worry about. Yesterday, the world turned its attention to one type of security. Those of us who spent yesterday in the United States uh, were bombarded with serious analysis of how we are doing in the battle against terrorism, one very serious security risk. Today we're talking about another security risk which could, over time, become much more serious. You know, in the ancient days, uh, that's five or ten years ago, it was the rich countries who were worried about climate change and the poor countries were too busy getting on with their short-term needs. Um, how that has changed. A recent Nielsen poll out just two weeks ago showed that while concern for climate change in the West is hovering roughly at where it was and has slumped seriously in the United States, in developing countries it is now at the top of many people's agenda. 90% of Latin Americans put climate change concern at the very top. This compares to 68% in Europe and only 48% in the United States. Why is it that nine out of 10 Indonesians, Thais, Mexicans, Malays, Vietnamese, Indians, Argentines, Turks put climate change at the top of their concern list for very good reasons? The last two decades have seen more progress in the fight against poverty and the fight for development than any two decades probably in the history of the world and yet a great deal of that is now threatened by climate change. We seem to be living in a, in a twilight zone at the moment, between on the one hand indifference that we're seeing in many places, and yet deep concern in other places. In many parts of the economy we're seeing worry and even despair, elsewhere we're seeing a great hope. Consider these tensions with regard to climate change. In Cancun, the world, for the first time, agreed to limit temperature increases on average to two degrees. This was a breakthrough. The problem is we're not on track to do that. Many experts think it's now impossible to do that. We now need to recalculate all of the impacts of climate change on development to consider a three degree and a four degree world. Consider this, 90 countries have now submitted targets and aspirations for 2020 to the UNFCCC for carbon emissions. This is an amazing thing. No one would have believed that three or four years ago. 90 countries, including 35 developing countries that don't need to, have laid out their plans. This is very good news. But if you add all those plans up and you go to the very most optimistic range of those plans, we're only slightly over half of the effort that would be required by 2020 to get us to where we need to get to. Consider green energy. Last year, $400 billion was invested worldwide in clean energy, including energy efficiency and transport-related energy. That's a remarkable achievement, and half of it was in the developing world. The problem is that would need to triple and quickly if we are to get onto a two degree world. Consider this, more than 110 countries now have specific policies, targets on renewable energy. And more than 35 developing countries even have feed in tariffs today. And yet in those countries, many of them, we're starting to see precisely the same kind of backlash and fighting back that we've seen in so many industrial countries. Consider carbon markets. Last year, $142 billion transacted in carbon markets. Not bad. We also now know with certainty that using carbon markets can lower the overall cost of addressing climate change. And we know that $27 billion has flown to developing countries, leveraging over $100 billion of clean energy in the last, clean investment in the last 
eight years, and yet the primary CDM market last year fell to 1.5 billion, down from 7.5 billion just three years earlier, and it's at risk of collapsing altogether because of total uncertainty as to where we're going with regard to the rules of the game and the future of Kyoto Protocol. So from where we sit, we see a combination of, of uh, discouragement and encouragement, business as usual, and sometimes we see breathtaking innovation. And I know the people in this room are part of the latter, the breathtaking innovation. Today in Geneva, 40 people are meeting charged with the design of the Green Fund. 40 countries, 25 developing countries, 15 from the rich countries, designing a green fund that came out of Copenhagen and Cancun. Remember, 100 billion were promised. Maybe considerably less than that will be from pu public sources. It's good that this green fund is being designed. But it's important to remember that it's not whether it's 10, 20, 50, or even 100 billion dollars that will come from public sources. It's how it is used. Consider this, for the developing world alone, investment overall last year was about $6 trillion in the developing world, $6 trillion. Now, not all of that needs to be totally reformed to move on to a climate resilient and low carbon development, but quite a lot of it does. In some sectors, small tweaks will be needed. In other sectors, major refurbishing. So we have to think of the $6 trillion, and then we have to ask the question, how do we use the 100 billion or the 50 billion? How do we use it surgically so that we can help the private sector who at the end of the day will be the ones that will determine whether we have success or failure? We're now two and a half months from the Durban Conference of the Parties. What could Durban achieve? Not a global deal, but progress on some very important building blocks. On mitigation, we could have clarification of those 90 countries that have made commitments, and we could have a serious discussion as to when global emissions need to peak. On adaptation, we could be setting up a serious adaptation committee charged with making important decisions. On technology, we could agree on the detailed design of the technology centers that were promised last year. We could agree on a new green fund, we could agree to incorporate agriculture under the convention in a way that it hasn't so far. Tonight, I'm going to South Africa to join a meeting of agriculture ministers who are coming from every country in Africa. Why? Because they want to fight to include agriculture, because agriculture is the most threatened sector. It's also a sector that could be part of the solution. There are triple wins investments that will increase yields, make those yields more resilient, and sequester more carbon into the soils. And so those agricultural ministers are coming together tomorrow to fight for that. And then two days later, we're part of a, a meeting of all the energy ministers in Africa. Why? Because, as Bjorn says, 65% of African homes don't have access to electricity. And until now, the perception has been that climate change will delay or prevent them getting access should be totally the opposite. Because of climate change, they should get access quicker, but they should get it differently. So far, Africa's received only 2% of all CDM money. That's not right. We need to change it. So it would be great progress if we achieve these things in Durban, but smart firms, smart companies, and smart countries are not waiting. Why is it this year that China is implementing a cap-and-trade system in four of its biggest cities and two of its most important provinces. And it's decided this cap-and-trade system will become nationwide by 2015. Is it because it's obliged to do that? No. It does want to be a good social, uh, a corporate global citizen, but it also knows that this will help it to promote more technology, draw in more foreign investment, create more jobs, promote more exports. We're now working in 130 countries on climate change. These countries have said to us, look, this is one of the most important subjects in the world for us. Please focus on it. And I know it's true of the UN, the regional banks. We're all in 
a similar situation. So our client countries urgently need a global deal, but they're not waiting for it. And nor are you, and nor are we. And I would like to pledge to you on behalf of the World Bank Group to work with you in as creative a way as we possibly can as we seek to bring in this new industrial revolution. Thank you very much.